Do you remember your sex education? Was it helpful to you? Was it filled with scientific information rather than real, practical advice? I'm Diggory Waite, and this is The Real Sex Education. Each week, I'll be joined by a guest. We'll impart our own sex wisdom, ask our own sex questions, and we'll go over all the things they don't teach you in school. To bring this all together, though, we'll need an expert. A sexpert, if you will. But the only sex and relationship therapist I know is my mum. Hello, mum. Hello, Diggs. In this episode, we speak to Tiger Drew Honey. It's always good to have a lovely chat about something meaty. We talk about growing up with parents in the porn industry. From an early age, I had a very euphemistic understanding of the basic logistics of a porn business. To porn's effect on young people. We had all of these young teenage boys around the country warping their own ideas about what real sex and relationships were. And we just talk about masturbating in general. I'd invite you for a drink, but, you know, I certainly wouldn't wouldn't invite you for, for a wank. <laughs> Hello and welcome to The Real Sex Education. I'm Diggory Waite and I'm joined as ever by accredited sex and relationship therapist Kate Campbell. Hello mum. Hello Diggs. Every episode mum and I give sex and relationships a good going over with a guest. This episode we're very glad to be joined by the star of Outnumbered, Cuckoo and the Tiger Takes On series, Tiger Drew Honey. We have a great chat with him about a lot of things but one thing we talk about in particular a lot was porn mum. Yes, we did. He knows a lot about it. He studied it. He studied it for the Tiger Takes On porn episode of the Tiger Takes On series. You're Mm. absolutely right. And his parents were part of the porn industry in their own ways. Mm. Um, His dad, he said sometimes when he goes out in the street with his dad, people will recognise his dad and be like, do I know you from somewhere? Not him. They recognise his dad, not him. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm sure different people recognise them both for different reasons. But, you know, so his dad, stage name, Ben Dover, big... Uh, porn star back in the day and producer and producer mm. and all of that got me thinking all the whole porn chat with tiger that we have later on in the episode got me thinking currently as we record this we're in the midst of a coronavirus pandemic and because of that there are people all around the world facing some sort of lockdown do you reckon more porn is being consumed right now well the research seems to show that it is and that both people on their own and couples are watching more porn. couples together are watching more porn. yeah yeah Yeah. Interesting. Together. Well, Mm. because there's been some research from the Kinsey Institute, which studies sex, and they've discovered that about half of couples have said that they're having sex less frequently and that they're having less satisfying sex as well. The quality's declined. So they're looking for ways of spicing things up, some of them. And and Mm. porn is one way. So so a lot of couples' sex they're having is going down. Yeah. Or it's less satisfying. I mean, in the middle of a pandemic... That's not surprising. It's not a very sexy atmosphere right now. No, exactly right. And people are very, very stressed. But another study from the Kinsey Institute found that couples who continue having sex, even though they're stressed, become less stressed. The more sex they have, the less Mm. stressed they become because it's very relaxing. So persevere, guys. Keep going. So fewer people are having sex and more people are watching porn. Why? Because... Well, one reason might be that they're on their own. They're not if they don't have a regular partner. You know, they they might be using porn. But also, uh, studies have found that people use porn when they're bored. They and there's a lot of mm. bored people around. And uh, it was really, really a stat I found so fascinating was that Pornhub got less viewers during the U.S. election night, and they thought that was because <laughs> people were either watching the coverage or else they were talking about it. And and so they weren't bored. Yeah, and also, you know, two old men, it's not very sexy. They're not the sexiest guys ever. Well, I suppose it depends on, on your taste. Yeah. Mm. Right, Mum, I'm not the only one who has questions for you like that. We've had some questions from the listeners at home who've sent in their sex questions and relationship queries to podcasts at hattrick.com and on the Twitter using the hashtag RealSexEDU. And later on, I'll be putting those questions to you. So I hope you're ready for that. I'm ready. Great. Before that, though, Mum and I spoke with Tiger Drew Honey and we began by asking him what his sex education was like. Well, do you know what, mate? It's like you said in the um, in the intro that um, at school, my sex education was was really all science based. Mm. My sex education, it was um, all done in biology lessons. It was all about the physical anatomy of the vagina and the penis and the testicles. And Mm. yeah, there were many 
great laughs and you know they were quite exciting lessons in a way because we were immature and got to look at these diagrams and you know we learned about how um the organs functioned and and, mm. and periods fallopian tubes semen production ejaculation pregnancy all these kinds of things but we never really learned anything past the sort of mere scientific biometrics we didn't learn about um you know the sort of say risks of sexually transmitted diseases particularly mm -hmm. we didn't really talk about consent we didn't talk about sexual relationships uh, healthy sexual relationships familial relationships you know we did have pshe class but i really can't recall any anything beyond the scientific stuff that we ever learned in that class so at school you know it's pretty non-existent which is mad really to think of it because it doesn't seem that long ago but it does seem mad to think that kids today are growing up in a world without that education what, what i find really interesting there is something that i don't think people have picked up on familial relationships you mentioned that what, what, what do you mean by that in, in a in a sort of sex ed context well i think what it means really is that um you know for instance people are into things like polyamory and stuff today and maybe have more than one sexual partner in, in a consenting way mm. those people can still have children and it's important for people to know and for those children to understand that that's legal and that's loving and you know coming from a family myself where my parents uh, ran a, a big porn company and uh, my dad was um you know he was a, a porn star and a porn director and a porn producer and cameraman and he did everything in the field and he was having sex with other women and and um and I uh there was a point in my childhood where I I began to understand that and you know, it was part of my, it was it was a, it was a normal part of my life. I, I can't say I objected to it because the way that my family life was, it was it was loving and it was normal. And and you know, my parents did end up splitting up, um, most likely as a result of of my dad's involvement in in the porn industry. But um, mm. it's important that I think we we don't say this is what a family looks like. This is the only way that parents can have sex. Mm. Um, and those are the kind of things that I sort of mean, those ideas, those concepts, when I say, you know, familial relations. It's funny as well, when I listen to interviews with you, some people sort of, excuse my phrasing, pussyfooting around the fact that your parents are in the porn industry. They'll say things to you like, they'll be like, your parents are also in the um, public eye and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, things like that. But in terms of the familial stuff, I jumped on that straight away because I'm here with my mum and uh, mm -hmm. and you know who's a, a sex therapist and we both had parents who I suppose maybe were a bit more maybe more sex positive is that right was was sex something that was because I think one of the things you talk about in those familial relationships is you know one thing parents don't do with their children is really discuss sex stuff you know D I mean did you ever have the talk with your parents um yeah and and, and interestingly um you know what you like say a uh, very sort of well, my my parents kind of pro sex. My parents didn't really have this kind of uh, take on it of sex is great. We really love sex. This is why yeah. we do this. It was it was a way that they'd seen to earn a really good living for themselves, and they managed to give me a really good life. And and they kind of uh, used to you know, let me let me run you by a sort of a conversation that might have happened mm. with a, with an eight year old me at a Christmas party. Say and we've got Pascal and Charmaine coming in the front door. Pascal's picking me up and walking me on the ceiling and giving me a present and and then dad comes over and he says oh this is um this is Pascal and, and Charmaine and and daddy takes pictures of Pascal and Charmaine having special cuddles mm -hmm. then with your mum's help we sell them to other adults and they buy them because they like them because they're fun mm -hmm. and so from an early age I had a very euphemistic understanding of the mm -hmm. kind of not the intricacies, but the basic logistics of a porn business. Um, mm. And it wasn't kind of, you know, all about the sex. It was, this is our job. This is what we do. This is an adult thing. It's mm. not the same as what your, what your friends at school do, because I was at school with tons of bankers and doctors and, and lawyers and all that kind of stuff. And I knew it was different, but you know, I was kind of aware that sex was a thing. And I don't know when it went from being special cuddles to understanding what sex was. Mm. Um, but I knew what sex was and I knew that it wasn't a bad thing. It was a way that my parents earned money. That was my basic understanding from quite an early age. Mm. I, I, and so if you, I'm guessing at that age, your parents were involved in the porn industry at school. Did, did you get a rough time for that? Um, I got, um, yeah, like a, a, a very, I wouldn't call it a, a big rough time, but the thing is most of my friends in my own like year, 
thought it was really cool. Like all my friends thought it was really, really cool. Yeah. But I remember once at school, uh, when I got into like year four or something, like a new class, there was like a girl, some parents had written into the school and asked um, that her daughter wouldn't sit next to me because of what my parents did for a living. Wow. Um, and then as I got into secondary school, some of the kids in the older years would um, pretend to hump each other over the stairs as I was walking up them or something and say, oh, your mum loves it like this, doesn't she? Um, oh, and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Yeah, it, it got to a point where something was said and um, and they got in trouble and they stopped after that. So I had to kind of snitch. I was scared to, but mm. I decided to. And, um, and that was that. But, you know, it didn't take up a great portion of my life. It never really traumatized me. And, and I was able to rise above it quite quickly. And because I knew in my heart of hearts what an amazing woman my mum is for instance mm. you know that's why it hurt in a way that's that's why it hurt because I knew how amazing she she is and she was um but because I knew in my heart that she wasn't like they were saying and that she was a good loving mother it couldn't get too deep because I knew they were just dicks and they were just wrong kind of thing sounds really hurtful though it sounds like a hor- it sounds horrible I know it does but the thing, I don't know I don't think any of them were um bad people I'm sure no. they're going to go on to have full and productive and fruitful lives but it's thoughtless isn't it it is thoughtless and it should be part of sex education as well to have some respect for other people's beliefs and backgrounds as well yeah. and that would never have happened definitely I mean you only have to start understanding a little bit and you'd stop doing that I think yeah, they totally. wouldn't have done it totally. I think you said in one of your documentaries you know who we have sex with does actually play a big factor in our in our identity and it's, i think it's interesting you say that about identity like sex itself like the the act of sex is such a kind of intrinsic part of our lives and our identity you know sex is is kind of the well it's the the precursor to life itself really mm. and it's mm. it is so strange that we've managed to get this far letting people go out into the world as young men and women without really knowing how they're supposed to act or what they're supposed to do you know it is a kind of minefield well it was it was kind of a minefield for me you know going out there trying to find my way as a as a young Mm. pubescent boy one thing i think that's absolutely right and i think you know sex education needs to play a massive part but hopefully one of the things mum and i are doing with this podcast and one of the things you're doing by coming on it and one of the things you've done with your documentary series is getting people talking about it more because one of the things as well is still to a big extent these days people still don't talk about sex even amongst their friends you know they still don't talk about it It seems that thing that's for the bedroom Mm. and that's it when the door of that bedroom shuts what goes on in there stays on in there and that's it and that needs to change as well because right now and i hate i'm going to bring it back to porn again just because i want to talk more about your documentary episode on porn right now what i think a lot of young people are seeing and what one of the things I feel like you found in the documentary you did is porn is being that educator for yeah. people and that can have adverse effects. Yes, well, I, certainly, actually. I, that, was a, that was a real learning curve for me, that documentary. As I was growing up with, the, you know, the, my kind of understanding of my parents living and stuff that I explained, I did have the kind of understanding that what my parents were taking pictures of was a performance, you know. Mm. I understood that it wasn't quite the same as the way that my mum and dad had made me that it was kind of a falsification as such. And I think the trouble arises when you get kids who haven't been sufficiently sexually educated, you know, they haven't been told the the right way to to ask for consent or to treat someone they want to have sex with. Mm. And they also haven't had sufficient sex education from their parents or whatnot. And they go out into the world becoming sexually active and they start watching porn and they might get into like porn that at the time that I was becoming sexually active was so easily accessible. You Mm. know, I could put one or two clicks on my phone and I could be watching some hardcore porn with some with like violence in it and stuff mm. you know and if I'm a kid who hasn't had that education and hasn't ever been with a, a girl before and I'm seeing that and I'm getting into that watching that all the time what then does my perception of what I'm meant to do the first time it happens for real mm. you know what's it going to be like how am I going to act and I remember that when I was doing my documentary that realization kind of came to me that We had all of these young teenage boys around the country warping their own ideas about what real sex and relationships were. And that was the biggest bombshell for me. That was the biggest moment where I thought, wow, this is actually a serious, quite a serious problem, Uh, especially some of the people that I met who were, uh, well, one of the people I met was kind of really addicted, getting really addicted into kind of dangerous porn with a very, 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 very small actual sex life. 
for mm. all these crazy and, and warped ideas. Because I think that's exactly right. I think that you speak about young guys and young girls, it's the same sort of effect, but the other way around. You know, young guys will see the porn and they think, that's what I'm supposed to do. Sometimes violent stuff, that's what I should do in sex. And similarly, girls are watching the porn and going, right, mm. well, that's what a guy expects me to do, so I'm going to yeah. do that as well. And yeah. I think... I mean, maybe, Mum, you can speak on this better than I can, but I worry sometimes that we haven't seen the full effects of just how sinister that can be until maybe, you know, a few years down the line. Because when me and Tiger were younger, it's surely there's only more porn out there and it's only more easily accessed. I mean, it's it's a phenomenal amount. It's unbelievable. Mm. There's more porn than anything else and there's more porn sites accessed than anything else, apparently. And there's all sorts of porn as well. <laughs> I remember hearing the statistic when I was a kid that 69% of the internet was porn. Mm. Two things are terrible there. One, I was too young to have known what that joke was, but it made complete sense to me. And two, that I thought it was real. You know, that I think that I, I can actually, it, at that it, young age... It seemed like it was within some realm yeah, of possibility exactly yeah. when i was um, i was researching something for a book and it was so funny because by the time i started writing it by the time i'd finished writing it the figures had changed completely they'd shot up mm. and it was something ridiculous it was so ridiculous that i was thinking i can't use this it sounds mad because it was so high is there a trend that you're seeing towards porn having an adverse effect on some of the clients that you're seeing Oh, undoubtedly, yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot of people who use a lot of a lot of porn can't have sex with humans, which is really difficult. And they sometimes use sex workers or something to to so that they can say, okay, I'm I'm this is a human, but it's not sex with a partner. It's 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 super normal. I think with porn, there's this there's this um, idea of just instant gratification. It's like yes. I can just open my phone and I can have an orgasm and I'm done. And that doesn't translate into the real world, but that's not how dating works. That's not how sex works. Mm. And I think it's dangerous because it gets people into the habit of just getting horny and sorting themselves out immediately and just having it right there all the time. People feel like it's their right to be in that state constantly. Mm. And and like you say, I mean, you can have it yeah, whenever you want it. It's there on your phone. It's ready to go. And I think this also goes on to something else that I was going to say, which was sex is still something that a lot of people don't speak about. And I also think for even the people that do speak about sex, there's another thing that's in the closet, so to speak, which is porn. Even when we, we speak to so many people each week on this podcast and porn is always this thing like hovering in the background mm. and it's always mentioned and we speak about it and we just touch on it for a moment and move off it. And it's nice today that we've actually got the space to talk about it a bit because I think it is so, so important and it's so ingrained and inherent at this point. And so now we, I think people just don't speak about it because it's so inherent or because they're too scared to. I'm wondering which one it is. I think, I think you're right. There's definitely that stigma. People definitely don't want to admit to it, even though I'm sure mm. more people do it than would admit to it. You know, people mm. do it like having a pint. I'd invite you for a drink, but, you know, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't invite you for, for a wank. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But, but, but it's, it's, it's an as common thing, I mm. think, for, for a, large, a large percentile of the population. It's kind of a a little secret you know yeah. I, I think one of the problems with computers is that there's that click and load element to it you can sort of click and there's the excitement you know wow what am I going to see next and that can draw you in and it can keep you there for hours I mean it, we, we all know how how you can get drawn into the internet and you start producing hormones which make you concentrate more and stay for even longer and nobody notices time passing and so i think that porn use has changed a lot since you were children and probably tiger since your parents were making porn when my parents were making porn they would make a film mm. um, and it'd be like an hour and a half long or whatever and you know as i got older, they explained it to me like oh yes people you know they have to be over 18 they have to show id and they like go up to london they go into a shop and they look around for half an hour and they buy a dvd for 90 minutes and then that DVD, my dad said to me at some point, their business model was that that DVD would be that guy's porn for a year, basically, mm. Mm. or, you know, a significant amount of time. And he would watch different scenes, different bits. And, you know, that was all, all really he had access to. And it's quite expensive. And if he wanted to get a magazine, he'd have to go all the way back to the shop and, you know, get a magazine with a certain number of pictures in it. And that was kind of it, that the scope was much smaller. Like you said, nowadays you can get drawn in and, oh, I've, I've, I've seen that girl, now I want to see this, I want to see that. Mm. And, all that. and 
such you know it's like a, a sweet shop and and people get desensitized and like you were saying some of your clients can't have sex with real people you know that's just going down the porn rabbit hole uh, you know there's not much to it other than just too much porn mm. do you know what? it's just this just seems wrong this just seems wrong because of outnumbered i just feel like i shouldn't <laughs> be talking to you to, about this there's a lovely picture of tiger behind his head of him as a little boy and that's that's the tiger i'm thinking oh. Oh. <laughs> i know sorry about that i've moved in i moved into my mum's for the lockdown there's pictures everywhere but it's <laughs> lovely. Everywhere. It's absolutely it's so lovely. And you know, of course, Digger is just like your brother on Outnumbered. He was just like that. The mad one. The mad one, yeah. Yeah, I thought I'd become a sort of like rugby boy as well. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm oh, yeah, like yeah, yeah. about as yeah. thin as a stick. I haven't no, really filled that. Not, not like Dan him Roche, who did play my little brother, he's about four foot wide. Not in a fat mm-hmm. way. He's just a tank. <laughs> yeah. Absolute tank. Yeah, and Digger is like a stick. <laughs> One thing I wanted to get onto, you know, you mentioned your relationship with your mum and your relationship with your parents. And am I right in thinking that you and your mum are working on a project at the moment? Well, we we were working on a on a project, on a writing project together. However, we've since sort of not because of any um, disagreements, just because we, this is the way it panned out. We've since moved on to doing two different writing projects. Right. As a kind of cathartic experience, um, like a healing experience, because I've been sober over two years now. My mum came to me, she said, I want to write a book about this, would you, would you do it with me? And we got into it, we started writing it together. We basically just realised that we didn't have space in 100,000 words to write all the things we wanted to write. Wow. You know, we both mm-hmm. needed 100,000 words kind of thing. So, yeah, um, I'm writing a book about that at the moment. And she's writing a book about, you know, from the perspective of a loving parent who's totally lost in the whole thing. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm hoping it will be a decent book. I've got, I'm going to put a lot of work into it because it's it's important to me that it's you know that it's good. Well, good for you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I just because I, I found that such an incredible story when I heard it because it's something that I had no idea about, and it's a period of your life that the way you explained it was it didn't sound great. I mean, probably in your own words, you can put it better, but it sounded like a really really bad period. But you're turning it into something something really great, and especially working with your mum, I thought that's really sweet. Yeah, you know, and, and we're, we're certainly, you know, we're helping each other along with it and I'm reading her bits and she's reading my bits. But, um, you know, the transformation from the darkness I was into the, the, the sudden ability to kind of get on with my life and start getting sober is just too much of a magical transformation to not dwell on. And if I can show to anyone who's staring down the throat of alcoholism or addiction, you know, that it can end, that, you know, there can be a happy life for you, you know, the misery is not forever if you just keep going and 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 i don't i don't know the the exact message in the book yet but i just mm. i just don't think i can i can leave it because i want to i want to try and help i want to try and give insight to the the chaos and the actual illness itself and how it can take a pretty good person with a good heart and just really make you such a selfish dickhead that you really don't <laughs> care about anyone well i mean just to try and link it back in some way to to the topic today i mean what is the difference in your relationships you know either personal ones or with your family and stuff what what is the difference in your relationships how how much was that were those affected by the addiction and how how different is it now that you feel like you're coming out the other side oh i'm told i'm told i mean mm. yeah my relationships like i had alienated myself from all my friends i didn't i had like no no friends um, by the time i was 18 and from about the age of 18 i i really no, I was only really seeing my mum and my dad if they were rescuing me from somewhere or if I was, um, I don't know, in need. I, I didn't didn't speak to them at all and they didn't really sleep at all. Mm. They were just waiting for the phone call that something awful had happened and just abused them, really. Mm. Um, you know, addiction is totally, totally a family illness and they suffered just as much as I did. And today we have phenomenal relationships. My dad lives out in Spain, which he would have never done if I mm. hadn't got sober. He's off there living his life. He's in a band, he's mm. local quiz champion, all this kind of stuff. You know, he's just, you know, he's given him a life. Um, and with my mum, she's got plans to move away next year as well, you know, onto the next chapter of her life. Now she can leave me without worrying about me. And, you know, I'm in my mum's house right now. I wasn't allowed in this house. You know, I wasn't allowed in this house mm. for, for a long time. And now I can stay here. Uh, you know, I can go and do the shopping. I could never, I wasn't allowed to go to a shop before because there would be this idea that I wouldn't come back um, because I'd get drunk on the way back and mm. not find my way home or something. Mm. You know, just all the t- the little things that um, I can do for my parents. I could just just be a son, you know. And I and, I, and the thing is, I know I'm gonna and I've got a really good chance of burying my parents today. 
Mm. Um, whereas it being the other way around, which was on the cards. Wow. I want people to hear this because I found this so fascinating. You said that it just one day you just woke up and you were like, what am I doing? Yeah, well, it was like I'd been um, trying and trying and trying and trying and trying and trying for years and it was just impossible. And so I kind of just gave up. And then just sort of out of nowhere, it just like I woke up and the, the compulsion to drink was just like gone for the first time in years. And that kind of stunned me. I was like, what, what the fuck? Mm. And I just stood there for a while. And then, I don't know, this motivation just built in me. I just kind of saw this day as this this opportunity. And I didn't really – and, and I, I started running with it and I made a phone call and I started embracing, a, you know, the 12-step program and, and basically just put in so much work in the early days. But it, it was – I didn't really understand the weight of it then. It wasn't until like a little while later I really started to – acknowledge the actual transformation in my life it was literally like it was literally like the 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 earth had been i don't know my my um my my will to live was gone and suddenly it was back and i had been trying to do it for so long and couldn't do it and suddenly it just occurred to me one day that maybe i should open my mind to the idea of some kind of loving force woven into the fabric of the universe Mm -hmm. as my sponsor put it to me and from that day forward, I opened my mind to that concept. And, and you know, that's what I go with today. I I believe that it wasn't down to me that I stopped drinking on that day. I don't really know what it was down to, but I kind of live on spiritual terms along that basis, if you get me. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I do believe there's something that looks after me. But I wouldn't underestimate your resilience, though. I mean, it's you 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 clearly have tons of resilience and resolve to have done that. It's amazing. Well done. It's incredible. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a it's a joy to be alive. It really is. Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And but but so many people don't make it. So you know, you've done so I well. Mm. I and I do my I try and do my best to to help those people on a daily basis. Right, well, towards the end of the show, we usually ask our guests, how was it for you? <laughs> Is there anything you've learned or anything you're taking away? Or uh, Yeah, no, it's been, you know, it's been really good. It's um, been a really lovely chat. It's nice to get some kind of expert input on these kind of things. And, you know, I, I also I do like I do like talking about my childhood because I know it's interesting and I know there's kind of something to be learned from it. And mm. also kind of reminiscing sort of vibes you know feeling like yeah. oh, I, wish I was young again all that kind of thing yeah. <laughs> but um you know it's um it's just been good to have a chat with some friendly people in this time where you know you can't really get out to see anyone mm. so mm. thank you for your lovely company very very much no it's no worry at all and i do apologize i mean are you sick of people asking about your parents at this point and being in the porn industry because i feel like everyone must have asked you about a thousand times um no it's um well you know you're right it's i i, I have been asked it a lot a lot a lot a lot um the two questions i've been asked the most are um so how much of outnumbered was improvised um, <laughs> and what's what's it like you know having four star parents or whatever and yeah you know i've made peace with those things i i kind of still like talking about them because i feel like i've spoken about them so much that i pretty much know all there is to talk about them with kind of thing so i feel very yeah. prepared for, for those mm. types of questions You've got you've got your answer and you got it down and it's ready to go. I am obviously I'm gripping the arms of my chair right now, trying not to ask you how much of outnumbered was improvised now. <laughs> <laughs> because I used to always see that at the end of the episodes, it would be like some of this has been improvised. And I used to be like, That's incredible, I need to learn more. <laughs> but I will spare you that. I will spare you that. But was it good for you too? So. That's the first person who ever asked that. How was it for us? I it was It's it was... been a delight. It's been wonderful to meet you. I'm so glad and proud that we got to speak to you oh, thank you so much it's been a it's been a pleasure it's been lovely thank you so much for having me it's the mailbag send kate your queries to podcast at hatch.com it's the mailbag send kate your queries podcast at hatch with two t's hello there i have a query for kate i would like to know when the real sex education mailbag starts the real sex education mailbag starts right now thank you Thank you so much to Tiger Drew Honey for coming on and speaking to me and mum. It was a great interview. He has such a unique perspective on the porn industry in particular. And if you were annoyed at the end there that I didn't ask him about the improv in Outnumbered, don't worry. I went away, did my research, and it was mostly the two younger children in it. 
So there you are. Right, now it's the time of the show that we open our mailbox so listeners can put their questions to Kate, an accredited sex and relationships therapist. Mum, would you like our first question? Yes, go for it. This one is from Anya and she says, My period has been all over the place the last year. It starts earlier than usual, sometimes stops again, then starts randomly and the flow is either really light or really heavy. I looked it up and I spoke to my friends about it and we're all convinced it's to do with lockdown. Is that possible? Yes, it really is. Any change to usual routine can cause a change in your hormone balance and mess up your periods. So it's very, very, very possible that people's menstrual cycles will have been affected by the pandemic and just by stress or just by changes in diet or sleep patterns, exercise, anything like that can have an effect. So yeah, very, very possible. But if you miss your period more than once or if you feel, have any other symptoms, it would make sense to just take a pregnancy test, get this checked out, just in case if you're sexually active, you are pregnant. Don't just assume that um, it's lockdown causing you to miss your period. But um, I, one interesting thing that's come out of all of this is that some people have found that during the weeks when they have their period, if they have long COVID, their symptoms reduce during the, or go away altogether during the week of their period. And researchers are so interested in this that they're thinking that they might be able to give oestrogen to men who tend to be more badly affected by COVID. And it might be that that's because they don't have oestrogen. Oestrogen might have a a protective effect oh wow that's amazing so then we'll be giving everyone the pill well yeah not quite that digs all right that's the last time i'll ever try and be clever the next question we have is from anonymous and it's short and sweet they ask how do i make my girlfriend squirt oh i think someone's been watching porn um mm. though people do squirt it's not as common as all that although it is extremely common in porn so possibly this person is wanting to see what it's like in real life and to be honest with you the most recent research makes a bit of a mockery of the whole squirting thing the most recent research shows that there's a big difference between what's called squirting and female ejaculation where a small amount of some sort of fluid is deposited in the vagina, which you probably wouldn't notice because, you know, the woman would be wet anyway. What happens with squirting, they think, is that it's it's we. They've done research where they look at bladders before and after sex. And if people have squirted, their bladders are emptier than they were beforehand, which is thought to prove that um, that it's it's just pee. And that's not what people thought. I mean, it's dilute, but it's but it still is pee. So it's all all interesting. And to be honest with you, there's been so much research. I think it's still a bit up for grabs. I wonder whether the partner is as interested as the person who sent in the question. It can be a lot of fun trying to to do it if both of the couple want to. But if it's a kind of performance where one partners putting pressure on the other to do something or the or you know one partner feels they have to to prove that they're a proper woman or whatever then all the fun goes out of it and it just becomes pressure so i think you know if you if you discover that you can squirt naturally then that's fine but there isn't any need to be obsessive about it and really try too hard i wouldn't have thought because it will take the fun out of it and that's no good yeah it does for me i'm a bit worried as well that this person has watched porn and thought oh i really like this squirting thing and they find it really exciting or they mm. think they look at squirting and they think that's the pinnacle yeah of being a good lover if i make yeah. my girlfriend do that so i want them to do that either way like you say i don't think that's a maybe the best reason behind doing it well there's a lot in the media that kind of encourages people to think that you will be a good lover if you can make your partner squirt and it isn't something that everybody really wants to do so you need to have a good old chat about it really and but but if it happens naturally then great and I have found that a proportion of couples that have sex therapy suddenly discover 
because they're experimenting, that they do squirt sometimes, uh, or maybe they only do it once, you know, who knows, it, but it, it happens. And they're often quite surprised and just a bit amused by it and interested in it. And, you know, it ha- it's, not, it's not something that they think, oh, gosh, we've got to keep doing this, or that they mind doing, it just happens. Yeah, and like you say, that's when the situation, the pressure is yeah. taken out of it. The pressure isn't on this person to make their yeah. partner squirt, and the pressure isn't on the person to squirt it's happened yeah. naturally i mean you mentioned that it's fun to try so we might as well do our duty at the same time and say if you were going to say how you would go about trying how would you do that well as i say people may react in different ways i mean it happens when somebody's very highly stimulated but some people find that if they stimulate the g spot which is a little button sort of shaped area just inside the upper wall of the vagina vagina if you use a kind of come hither motion with two fingers sometimes that can cause a lot of arousal and cause somebody to squirt there's also an area around the urethra that some people find if if it's stimulated they'll squirt but not everyone has the anatomy to do that and not everybody wants to do that but if it's if it's fun trying then you know go for it yeah so anonymous go back talk to your girlfriend actually just play what mum's just said then And then see if she's up for it as well. You know, I mean, that's the best way. Let's be honest. Excellent. Well, that's all we have time for today. But thank you so much to Tiger Drew Honey for coming on the show and speaking to us. He was so open and honest and we really appreciate him taking the time. Thanks as ever to resident sex expert Kate Cabell. Thank you so much, Mum. Thank you, Dix. And thank you all for listening. We'll see you next episode. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Real Sex Education, which is hosted by Diggory Waite and Kate Campbell. The show is produced by Andy Goddard and Diggory Waite. The Real Sex Education is a Hattrick podcast. If you'd like to hear more podcasts by Hattrick, including Time Ghost with Alexander Armstrong and Ben Miller, just search Hattrick Podcasts on your podcast provider of choice. This podcast is based on the real-life relationship between Diggory Waite and his mother, registered sex therapist Kate Campbell. The show is therefore inspired by, but otherwise unrelated to, the TV show Sex Education. But, yes, Diggory does wish his co-host was Gillian Anderson. 